Hello, 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 and welcome back to yet another uh, college football video. We're back with the rankings. Way too early, top 30, number 24 through 20, this video. Let's get right into it, man. How are y'all doing? I'm doing good, man. Feeling good, looking good, everything. All right. So, as we all know, last video, I went through number 30 through 25, Colorado, Tulane, a and Kansas State, SMU, and Memphis. And in this one, we're going to finish off the playoff long shots, the last group of those teams where um, they could make the playoff, you know, possibly if they win the division, a few group of five teams, you know, stuff like that, lesser uh, power four teams. Uh, but... We're going to get to a couple of teams in this video where I think they actually have like a really good shot at making the playoff, but they might not be as good of a roster as some of the teams up, the, up top. Sorry. So got my trusty notepad. <clears throat> Let's get right into it. Starting off, number 24, we got Liberty. Liberty Flames from Conference USA. They obviously started last season off 13-0. and 0, Got as high as number 18 in the rankings. And they ended up losing to Oregon in the bowl game. But here's the thing, right? The Oregon loss, that was supposed to happen. People, I don't understand. Oregon was a top three team in the country, in my opinion. They just so happened to lose to Washington close twice. Like, Oregon should have, like, if it was a 12-team playoff, I'm not so sure Oregon wouldn't have been in the national championship. Okay? So, Liberty ran into that buzzsaw. They never stood a chance. Okay? So, I... I don't hold that loss against them, right? And Liberty, they are my highest rated group of five team, okay? And this is the thing. I think they're actually going to start off 13-0 and back-to-back -back years. And if they do that, they're pretty much a lock for the college football playoff, right? Wouldn't you think? Because all you got to do to earn a spot is be the highest ranked group of five team. If they start 13-0 and like last season, I mean, who are they competing with? Probably the winner of the AAC, Tulane or Memphis. But, I mean, I don't know. Would they be ranked higher as 13-0? I mean, Memphis or Tulane, one of them would probably have to go like 12-1 and with the conference championship. So that'd be a pretty interesting debate, but we'll see what happens there. All right, let's get into what they did last season. What were they good at? Well, first thing you should notice is that they were the best running team in the country. Um, which is incredibly impressive. Nearly 300 yards per game, obviously. When we talk about Liberty, you know, in Conference USA, we're not talking about the highest level of competition. OK, I understand that. But still, if you dominate that level of competition, that's what you're supposed to do. Liberty is too good for that conference and they dominate accordingly. Top five in total yards per game, top 10 in points per game, did not give up any sacks because they rarely threw the ball. But when they did, their yards per attempt and completion were damn near at the top of the country. Like they threw a lot of bombs via play action and stuff like that, still turned it over a little too much for my liking. You'd assume a team that does not give up any sacks and runs the ball incredibly well would not turn it over that often. So that was a little shocking when I found that out. But they did play 14 games compared to, like, the average 12 or 13. So who knows? Defensively, they weren't really that good. They did break that 25 takeaway mark. So, you know, if you're 20 takeaways, I'd say, you're you know, you're pretty good. 25 plus takeaways you really are in that top top tier as you can see they were top 10 in that category everywhere else you know got a fine amount of sacks top 50 in points per game top tier in terms of stuffing the run that was pretty solid we're not a great pass defense you know I'd say they were good overall you know did their job certainly it certainly helps when you, you know your offense is controlling time of possession and stuff so much by running the ball so often so I think Liberty, you know, statistically great offense, good defense, which led them to 13 and 0. Here's the roster we're working with, okay? So they lost their star receiver, CJ Daniels. He left to go to LSU, okay? So, but they still have the duo, which made them the best running team in the country running back Quentin Cooley and quarterback Caden Salter. I do think Caden Salter is like a top 10 quarterback in the country because he also was able to hurt you with his arm and a lot of deep passes, a lot of bombs. So I think he would be a top 10 QB in the country for me. And I do think they might lead the country in rushing yards again, back to back seasons. And look, defensively, they don't need to be a top end unit. OK, defensively, they just need to do what they la did last year. Get 20 plus takeaways, um, control time of possession. 
and let their offense do their job, run the clock out. But, I mean, you got four new starters via the transfer portal. I just think, sim- simply put, I think they have the best roster in the conference. It should be a relatively easy path. You know, it's like, let's look at the schedule. Starting off with what they did last season, you want to talk about dominance. Where is the game they didn't win by multiple scores? It looks like every game, with the exception of Middle Tennessee State, they won by at least two scores. And starting at Middle Tennessee State, they had their last seven regular season games, including the conference championship, they scored 40 points six out of seven times. The only non-40 piece was Old Dominion, which they scored 38. So they hit the road. Like, they, they found their groove, and they were just – almost impossible to stop like these conference usa teams just they had no answer and obviously we know what happened when they ran into oregon that was not a fair matchup for them by the way i would have loved to see them versus lsu just you know putting that out there but taking a look at what they got next year okay they don't play a single team in my top 30 that's probably the only team on this entire rankings i'm going to be able to say this about their schedule is so easy and on top of that i don't even think I'd have any of their opponents in my top 50. Maybe App State, if they still have that quarterback. I don't know if he's still there or not, but they're the only team that I would even consider putting in my top 50 or 60. So Liberty's schedule is by far the easiest we'll see on this entire list. And they dominated the exact same competition last year. So why would I assume with the returning head coach, quarterback, running back, that anything would be different? Um so I expect the same results. And overall, I think Liberty, they have never had a losing record in the school history. OK, I don't expect them to start now. I think they will be 26 and two over a two year span with a college football playoff appearance. I think this is going to be the group of five team that makes the college football playoff. And look, I, I don't know. Because last season, they played a dominant team, an amazing team. Oregon last year was truly a great team. So if they don't play a team of that caliber, don't they get a home playoff game too? Like if you you make that top five. So if they played like a – who knows who they'd have to play? Like just a fraud, like Penn State. If Penn State makes the playoff, like would they get to play Penn State? Or actually, if they were the the lowest rated – conference champion wouldn't they play the highest rate non-conference champion Ooh, that would be tough that means they'd have to play like fucking texas or something damn yeah that at least it'd be a fun game i just want to see a team them play a team that doesn't have a great physical defense so it'd be a shootout like that's all i want to see they may win they may lose who knows but i they're certainly going to put together an exciting game i would i would assume moving on flip the page here louisville number 23 for me they're in the ACC, obviously. They had a shocking season last year. They were a couple people's dark horse, so it's not like they were completely slept on. But I'm sure not that many people thought they'd make the ACC championship game. Uh, this offseason so far, they've been very active in the transfer portal. They had their first 10-win season since 2013. So that's that's before Lamar even. That's kind of crazy. That I assume they just won 10 games with Lamar as quarterback, but I guess not. Um, and they are looking to go back to back here as in terms of 10 win seasons. Uh, and I, I think they can. I definitely think they can. They got us ranked as, as high as the top 10 last season. Can y'all believe that? I don't think they were ever in my top 10. I didn't really buy into the hype. And I think that proved to be true. Let's get into their uh, stats real quick here. Kind of two lane vibes, to be honest with you, because they weren't great offensively. They weren't top 35 in anything offensively that kind of shocked me they were a pretty good running team because they had a really good tandem of running backs over 30 points per game they turned it over too much certainly I can say that with confidence but they did play 14 games compared to some of these other teams um passing yards certainly they were not a great passing offense gave up too many sacks though maybe that's part of the reason why uh defensively um you know they were you know top 40 and everything except for passing yards allowed which is so tough to stop the pass um, 21st in total yards allowed, great run defense, top 10 in the country under that 100-yard mark. That is really impressive. Um, only 21 points per loud or points allowed per game. That is pretty good, I'd say. 20 takeaways, they made that. You know, they broke that threshold. So, But overall, I'd say really pedestrian 
stats, you know, nothing sticks out here. It's kind of like, damn, this was a, one of the best teams in the country last year. Let's get into the roster and the changes in the roster. I mean, I think Colorado returned more starters offensively than Louisville, which is crazy. Maybe they returned the same amount because fucking quarterback, two receivers, I think. So, yeah, maybe it is the exact same amount, but that's crazy. A non-Colorado team bringing in eight new starters. That's that's kind of wild. Um, so let's get to it. Obviously, last year, Jack Plummer, the quarterback, was average at best. I think that's being pretty nice. Um, Tyler Show, transfer from Texas Tech, should be an upgrade if he can stay healthy. Now, that is a massive if. I think the man's played like seven games the last two years. Like, he, he, he legit just cannot stay healthy. So it's almost like it's almost a pretty big fucking risk. Like you, you want that guy, the guy that cannot play more than fucking five games in a season. So I don't know. I really don't know how to feel about Tyler's show. If he's healthy, you know, I'd say he's a pretty good quarterback, but he's never fucking healthy. So, so I don't know how to feel about it. It's tough to, to judge and predict that they did lose both their star running backs to the NFL, which come by the way, they combined for nearly 2,500 yards and 25 touchdowns. So that is a massive chunk of their offense. They lost the NFL. Um, I think they're going to try and switch it up a little bit. They brought in Colin Lacey from South Alabama, I believe. I think he led the country in receiving yards last year. Maybe not. I don't think he led the country, but he certainly was up there. I think he broke 1,300 last year out South Alabama. So he was a massive get in the transfer portal. Also brought in Ja'Cory Brooks from Alabama. He had a really good year two years ago. Didn't play as much last season, but I think that's a big addition as well. Um, so obviously massive additions to the wide receiver core. I think they're going to try and shift to a more pass heavy offense, you know, by losing both their running backs, upgrading at quarterback, upgrading at wide receiver, at least, you know, from the outside looking in, that seems like what they're trying to do. Donald Chaney is the new running back, but he only had 500 yards last season at Miami. So obviously now that he's the number one, I expect a, a big season, but still obviously, you know, not nearly what they had last season in terms of running back talent. Um, defensively, they return Ashton Gillette, who had 11 sacks last season. He is their their guy. He's their impact player. Their star defensively. They lost a couple players to the NFL, but overall, we saw their defense was pretty good overall. They returned seven starters. It looks like right here, so I'm not too concerned, you know, with the uh, loss of talent there. Let's take a look at their schedule. We know what they did last season. Started off as that nine and one. 10 and one actually that a weird loss to fucking pit but this is the thing that i don't like for louisville three fourths of their losses three out of their four losses came against unranked teams with that being pit kentucky and usc without caleb like those are bad losses to have on your schedule but they the, all the weird thing so they lost three games against unranked teams but they won four out of their five toughest games miami Duke, Notre Dame, NC State, they won all of those. And Notre Dame and Duke, they won fucking convincingly. So it's 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 so weird. Like, do they do they just show up in the big games, but they can't take care of business? I don't know what to think about that. So they play four out of my top 30 next season, which isn't too bad. Notre Dame, SMU, Miami, Clemson. Honestly, for an ACC schedule, that I mean that's that's solid, you know. Their last three, three games are relatively easy. Um, let me see the first one. I can't see it actually. Okay, so the first three and their last three are pretty light to be honest. But as I say that, they lost to Pitt and Kentucky last season, so they have a chance to avenge those losses. So if I'm just looking at the schedule, I say, okay, we're pro I'm pro sorry, I'm probably thinking nine to ten wins in the regular season. Maybe, you know. They have a chance to control their destiny here because they're competing with teams like SMU, Miami, and Clemson for that or ACC championship spot, and they play all three of them. So if you win two or three of those games, then we're probably talking about Louisville in the ACC championship game because you can lose to Notre Dame. You can lose to Kentucky. It doesn't matter. But how do you do against Miami, Clemson, and uh, SMU? Those are the big games. And you get, you get Miami at home. You get SMU at home. Clemson on the road. That's going to be a really tough game to win for Louisville. But – Hey, man, their schedule, it does not seem too difficult to me. So overall for Louisville, I would say almost a completely reworked offense. A lot of question marks there. Use the transfer portal heavy. 
but they should win nine to 10 games in the regular season and be one of the main contenders for the ACC championship game. Moving on, we got Clemson. Clemson at 22 for me. And listen, guys, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of ranting in this in this segment here because Clemson is one of the only teams I truly hate. And I wouldn't even say it's the team, but Dabo Sweeney, I, I just cannot stay in the man. He is a complete idiot because he refuses to use the transfer portal. It is mind-boggling to me that the man is allowed to just take a moral stance on his team being worse. And that's so, like, you know what? Like, no, it's okay. Like, nobody cares. It's like, I, it's one of the strangest things in college football. They just barely, by the way, barely managed to go four and four last year in the ACC. They were five and zero oh against non ACC teams. But in the ACC, the weakest Power Five conference, they went 500. Like, that is insane to me. And it's the first time since 2010 that they've won less than 10 games. They had, a, they had a chance. They had a bowl game. They won that shit. But before the bowl game, they were fucking eight and four. So it's like they were awful last year. Uh, they were awful. Don't let a fucking bowl game versus Kentucky fool you, please. Let's get into the stats, man. What, by the grace of God, their defense led the country in takeaways. That is the only thing that I think keep is keeping Dabo in his fucking job right now. Because without that, they would have lost an extra two games probably. It would have been fucking, what's that, seven and five? Like, man. Led the country in takeaways. Shout out to their defense, man. It's the only good thing about Clemson. Look at the offense, man. They weren't top 40 in anything. In anything. They had a really good running back duo. That's the only positive. Phil Moffa and Will Shipley were a pretty good running back tandem. That's the only thing I can say about the Clemson offense. They didn't crack 30 points a game. They were 50th in yards per game. They were not able to throw the ball effectively. Worse than fucking Louisville. Um, offensive line was not good. 22 turnover. 22. Bottom, bottom of the barrel in terms of offensive turnovers. And then defensively, obviously, we know. And I was hating on Clemson's defense, by the way. I, th- I said this year they wouldn't be top 20. I, I was wrong. I was objectively wrong. Top 10 in yards per game, passing yards per game. It's so tough to stop the pass, but not when you're in the ACC playing teams like fucking Wake Forest. Um, led the country in takeaways, obviously. Top 40 in everything. Top 30 points per game. Like, it was a great defense, objectively. It's the only thing they had going for them. So I, I'll, I'll walk back that statement about Clemson's defense. Getting into the fucking roster here. I got a lot to say. So, Clemson has not been good offensively in a while. I really do not expect that to change as long as Dabo's there. Let me tell you why. He said, he said, most of the players in the transfer portal weren't good enough to play for them. You guys look at this offense. You guys tell me how many of these offensive players right here, Troy Stiletto, Antonio Williams, Tyler Brown, Let me tell you right now, I could probably find 30 receivers in the transfer portal who would be Clemson's number one, 30. But but according to Dabo, they're not good enough to play for Clemson. Um, I could find five to ten quarterbacks just in the transfer portal, probably better than Kate Klubnick. And here's, you know, I feel bad for Kate Klubnick Klubnick, because most of these other quarterbacks have coaches and programs that are willing to, you know, improve the roster and acquire talent through the transfer portal. Cade Klubnik is not gifted those opportunities. So I really feel bad for him. But, you know, it's tough to make it. When you got Tyler Brown, Antonio Williams, and Troy Stiletto, what are you supposed to do, brother? They got two sophomores and a junior. There's a bunch of graduate, five-year senior, senior, great players, great receivers in the transfer portal. We've already talked about in this video what Louisville did going out and acquiring guys Clemson thinks they're those guys are not going to play for them let's see I'm gonna make a video when the season's over talking about how many transfer receivers were miles better than whatever the fuck Clemson has next season I it's it's truly crazy to me not to mention I could probably find 20 guys running backs out of the transfer portal who could come in pair with Phil Moffa and you could at least try to recreate what Will Shipley did last season. Instead, they got redshirt freshman, Jay Haynes. He's better. He's better than all these guys, all these running backs in the transfer portal. Cut me a fucking break. Listen, 
strictly recruiting is not enough to win in today's game. Clemson's fucking proof. Every year, you think it's a coincidence? Every year that the transfer portal becomes more and more apparent, Clemson gets worse and worse because guess what? Their top in competition, especially in their conference, are bringing in a fuck ton of transfer portal players. So they're getting the same amount relatively, slightly worse recruiting, I guess, out of high school that Clemson's getting, but they don't have to wait for these guys, wait three or four years for these guys to develop into good players. They can go and pick out the good players out of the transfer portal right away. And Clemson's out here with redshirt freshmen, sophomores, juniors, competing with guys who are fucking four, fifth, sixth year starters out of the transfer portal, greatly assembled rosters. They're just at a disadvantage. And here's the thing about Dabo Sweeney. If Dabo Sweeney was a CEO of a company, right, and he refused to do something that all of these rival companies were doing, which was proven to work, like a proven thing that brought success and wealth and revenue to the company, if Dabo Sweeney had a moral objection to doing that, guess what would happen? He'd be fucking fired. In the real world, Dabo Sweeney would be without a job because he had a moral objection to what all these other companies are doing. That's not how the real world works. You can't just choose to be worse. You get fired. You get replaced. But in college football, for some reason, we we value so much what he did five, six, seven years ago that now because, you know, he's resting on his laurels and it's just OK that they're worse. It's OK that they won 500 in the ACC last year because of Dabo Sweeney. Like, I, I really don't know how long they're going to keep playing this game with him. I would have fired him after last season and went out and got somebody else because th- he's just choosing. He is choosing to be inferior. He is choosing to be worse. That's insane to me that that's allowed to happen. I would be fucking pissed if I was a Clemson fan. The defense that carries it, this is the thing too, the, that same defense that led the country in takeaways and carried them last season, they lost five out of their best seven players, at least to the transfer portal. I think they lost a safety as well. Sorry, they lost five of their best seven players to the NFL, and I believe they lost a safety to the transfer portal. So they lost like six starters, and six of their best starters are gone, out the door. And guess who they're replacing with? I see some sophomores out there, um, some juniors. I'm Yeah, I'm sure those sophomores – are going to replace, you know, five NFL-level players. I'm sure it will. Would have been nice if they got some transfer pool players, but, you know, guess not. And like I said, man, I would be pulling my hair out if I was like a diehard Clemson fan because they're just – you got to accept mediocrity. You got to accept the fact that the roster, it's not getting better. You're stuck with what you got here. And poor Cade Klubnik, man, I really wish he'd leave, man, because he deserves better. You you deserve – you deserve to be given the same opportunity – to succeed as everybody else and all these guys on Clemson they're not being given that opportunity I, I really do feel bad for them uh let's get to their schedule here's the thing about Clemson last season they lost to the four best ACC teams they played think about that the team that used to dominate this conference dominate lost to all four of the good ACC teams they played NC State Miami Florida State, Duke, all beat Clemson, all beat them by at least seven points. Florida State was a close game, but all beat them by at least seven. It wasn't like a field goal game, one, two point, all beat them by at least seven points. Duke dominated them. Week one, Duke embarrassed them. Duke, like they were two and two at one point. They were four and four. And guess what? After they went four and four, they played some frauds, Notre Dame, North Carolina, and some non-conference opponents in fucking Kentucky and Notre Dame. So, or sorry, fucking South Carolina, Kentucky. So, listen, man, they were they were five hundred. They were five hundred in the worst Power Five conference. I just can't take you seriously as a team. Um, Georgia is going to absolutely slaughter them. Ne- the week one next season, they're going to get embarrassed worse than they did last season against Duke because Georgia they get them at home. Their home fans are going to leave after the third quarter. I I would assume, but. Man, George is going to do unspeakable things to them. Then this is a thing I hate because I really I, I hate Clemson, but I don't want to put them as high. Like if their schedule was slightly more difficult, they wouldn't be in my top 30. But because they're in the ACC and they play a light schedule, I would rather err on the side of caution and not hating too heavily 
because last season I think I had him in like my top 15 around like 13. That was too generous. So this season I'm, I'm dropping him eight spots or sorry, nine spots. I'm dropping them from like 13 to 22 because that's what they deserve. They deserve a massive drop in respect. Um, NC State, Florida State, Louisville, those should be relatively difficult games, but they get Louisville and NC State at home. Clemson is still a pretty tough place to win at, you know, for the opposing team. So they play four of my top 30. It's not that much. And like I said, three out of these four games at home. How the fuck? Why does Clemson get eight home games? Eight? They only go on the road four times. What the hell? What What is this? Am I fucking dr- Am I not seeing right? Georgia, App State, NC State, Stanford, Virginia, Louisville, Seattle, South Carolina. What the hell is that? And these powerhouses, they got to go on the road. They got to travel to the Wake Forest. They got to travel to – by the way, Wake Forest almost beat them last season in an embarrassing fashion. They got to travel to Pitt, to Virginia Tech. Wow. that Virgin, hot, Circle that Virginia Tech game. Like, man, they got it so easy. It's so, It pisses me off, man. I really do hate Clemson. But I cannot wait till Dabo Sweeney gets fucking fired. Man. Per, truly praying on their downfall. Here's the, here's the end for Clemson. They'll probably cruise – to our eight or nine win regular season just because their schedule is that easy. And they play eight home games, eight home games. Um, but I will be praying on their downfall. There's no way they make the playoff. There's a 0% chance they make the playoff, but uh, they're going to have an easy schedule. So it is what it is, man. Moving on, we have Washington at number 21. <sighs> listen, listen, a lot of people are writing off Washington because at the end of the day, they basically – were just an upgraded version of TCU in that they dominated the regular season. Unlike TCU, they did win their conference championship games. They were undefeated into the national championship game, but they ran into a buzzsaw who was simply better than them on both lines of scrimmage. And their roster got absolutely nuked in the following off season, just like TCU. So most people are writing them off. Okay. But I'm going to highlight some of the moves they made because I do think they are going to rebound better than TCU did. So let's get into that, man. It's almost disingenuous showing you the stats from last season because it's a completely different team and a new conference with a new coach and everything like that. But I think we can still highlight some of the things they did last season. Obviously, they were one of the best passing games in the country. Um, They did that while also having such a good offensive line that they were bottom five and sacks allowed. Um, They didn't turn it over too much, but they played 15 games compared to the average 12 or 13. Um, You know, defensively, They weren't great, to be honest. Their defense proved to be their weakness. But situationally, situationally, Washington's defense was actually pretty impressive. Like, I'm going to get to a couple games where they struggled offensively, but their defense did pull through. Um, Let's get to that roster, though, because these stats, you know, it's a whole new team. As you can see, I believe that they only return three starters on offense, and those three starters – it might be less than that because the only three, because I know that they lost eight players at least to the draft. So offensively, I believe the only players that even can be the same are their left guard, center, and right guard. But wait, look at that. Their left guard's a redshirt freshman. So he's new. Their center's a sophomore, which means he would have been a, a freshman. He might be, new. <laughs> they might have 10 new starters on offense. That's insane. That's insane. But the good news is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those guys were already with the team. So that's usually a pretty, you know, e- that's an easier transition than bringing in, you know, like Colorado, a whole new team from the transfer portal. Um, they brought in Jed Fish from Arizona. He's the new head coach. I like that hire. I think it's a pretty good hire. Arizona last season was very respectable. And Jed Fish built that program back up from pretty, pretty much nothing. So I, I like that hire as head coach. Um Here's the thing about Will Rogers, because he's the new quarterback. I shitted on him a lot last year at Mississippi State because he was ass. But the team was ass. The offense was ass. Pretty much, It was a horrible situation, obviously, after the the late Mike Leach died. So, Will Rogers, if it works, if he fits in, he could be the third best quarterback in the Big Ten and maybe even the second best. Honestly, honestly, all bias aside, would you rather have Will Rogers or Will Howard? 
I'm sure a lot of people would take Will. I'm sure a lot of Ohio State fans would rather have Will Rogers. So I'm not sure. He. Hello, hello, hello. The mic dying always catches me off guard. I'm sorry about that. Let's get back to what I was talking about. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a situation where Will Howard obviously wins more games, has the better team. But if we break down the stats, Will Rogers was actually the better quarterback at the end of the season. So, hey, having a top two, three quarterback in the conference, that's still a pretty good sign right there. Um, they, I love their running, but their, their running back tandem, Jonah Coleman from Arizona coming along with Jed Fish. And Cam Davis, here's the thing about Cameron Davis. He was supposed to be their number one last season. He got hurt before the season started. And then uh, Dylan Johnson obviously took over and did very well. But Cam Davis was supposed to be their guy. He had like 13 touchdowns in 2022. So Jonah Coleman, Cameron Davis, I love that duo right there. That could That's the strength of this offense in my eyes which is good for a new Big Ten, you know, having two running backs that you like, that's kind of the, you know, the standard in the Big Ten. And Jeremiah Hunter, he's their new wide receiver one. He comes in from Cal, and, you know, obviously Cal is not known for their passing game, but Jeremiah Hunter still put together a really respectable stat line over there. So I think he's going to step in and be Will Rogers' favorite target. So I look at this offense, and it's better than I thought it would be. Like, I thought it'd just be absolutely gutted, and it was. But the guys they brought in, Will Rogers, Jonah Coleman, Cam Davis, Jeremiah Hunter, those are all basically new players, and I think they're good. Like Denzel Boston, Giles Jackson, they should be solid. The offensive line is what I'm really concerned with because they were so good last season, but you lost a couple of those players, and it's going to be tough to replace, especially both tackles. Both tackles you lost, it's tough, man. But if they can just run the ball, take some pressure off of Will Rogers, I really do think this could still be a dangerous offense. Um, defensively, they need to learn how to generate pressure without Braylon Trice because he basically was their pass rush. Like, if he wasn't getting home, nobody was. So without him, they got to figure something out because or else it's going to be bad. And listen, I'm I'm not sure how Washington isn't going to be worse than they were last year. Like, it's just – like, defensively, I mean. Like, it's – you lost Jabbar Muhammad, your best secondary player. You lost Bryce or Braylon Trice, your best defender on the entire team. You lost a couple, like you like, lost a safety, you lost a linebacker, good tacklers. Like they're going to be worse. The question is how worse. Like that's that's the only thing I'm concerned about. Cause like it's it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be pretty bad defensively. Like I don't expect like the only thing that kind of saves them is that in the Big Ten, they're not going to be playing many explosive offenses. Like the only team that they play on their schedule that that I'm like I'd be concerned is going to put up like 40 plus on them is Oregon, but everybody else, I feel like they could pretty much just deal with it and keep it close. And their offense, they might just win a close game, depending on how good they are situationally. Cause last season, let's get into it. They won every close game that they were in. Like it, if it was close, Washington was winning that game. And let me point out what I was talking about, about their defense last season, how they came in clutch that Arizona state game that they played. That was their defense that won them that game. Their offense couldn't do shit. And their defense came – they had like a pick six late that won them the game. Um, the game against Oregon State, their defense kept them in it. Like, they had moments. Like, Utah, they held Utah scoreless like the entire second half, I think. Like, their defense really did step up what they need when they needed to. Texas, obviously, they stopped Texas at the end of the game. So – like I said, man, or both Oregon games, their defense, like it, their defense, while yes, it wasn't good statistically, they still had their moments, and that's why they were able to win their first fourteen games in close fashion most of the time. Um, here's the thing, though: look at all the teams they played. Let me. Where is? Did I write this down? Yeah, look at the teams they played last season. Let's just count them: teams that they played that were ranked at some point: Arizona, Oregon, USC, Utah, Oregon State. Washington State, Oregon, Texas, Michigan. They played nine teams last year that were ranked in the top 18 at one point, I think. And they were 8-1 and one against them. Like, they were battle-tested last year. They don't have many of those players. 
but they were absolutely battle tested last season. Next season, they only play three of my top thirty, and that's that's Michigan, that's Penn State, that's Oregon. So, like the the others on there, like this isn't a tough schedule. Iowa, come on, it's Iowa. USC, come on, there it's USC. UCLA, not tough. Like Rutgers, not tough. Northwestern, not tough. Like these these are teams. Washington State, like what Pete, like Washington State, Northwestern, Rutgers, Iowa, USC, U, UCLA. I'm expecting them to win like five out of those six. I would expect that honestly. So when you even when you look at their tough games, Oregon on the road, I'm penciling that in. There's no way they run that game on the road at Oregon. They just can't win that. But at Penn State, that's going to be tough. But they get Michigan at home. Michigan's not that good offensively, man. Like they have Washington has the much better offense than Michigan. So I expect that to be a really close game. I expect the Penn State game to be really close. Penn State can't throw the ball. They can't throw the football. So their defense is going to be tough. They might get to Washington, but I don't know, man. Like I, I think they could win both of Penn State and Michigan, certainly split it. So I, I do expect them to drop like one game their regular schedule but i'm looking at it man i think they could pull out 10 win i could see it with a bowl game they probably need one they probably need a bowl game like i think a nine and three regular season is very possible probably like probably nine wins overall but I, they could get to 10 like i'm not ready to to rule out washington i could all this the thing i could also see them completely falling apart like will rogers straight up just does not work their defense sucks like i could see that happening like, they might not be good enough in the Big Ten on either line of scrimmage. But 10 wins, I can see it, man. I can see 10 wins. Like, 10 and 3 at the end of the year, that would be amazing. Like, if they somehow – if they won nine games, like, everybody should clap it up. Like, good job, Washington. But if they won 10, wow, that would be so impressive, man. Because they got new – their roster was new. Moving on to the Oklahoma Sooners. Big, t- sorry, they are not Big Twelve anymore. They are now in the SEC. I was I was wrong about that. Last season, went ten and three, and they were surprisingly good last season. They were even ranked in the top five at one point. Of course, after beating Texas, they did lose their star quarterback, and now they have to deal with possibly. We're going to get into it. Possibly the toughest schedule in the country. Let's talk about their stats last season and what they were able to do as a team. They had a case. They had a case for a top five offense because they were top five in yards per game, over 500, top five in points per game, well over 40, nearly top five in passing yards per game because Dylan Gabriel was an absolute monster. Dylan Gabriel really, if they would have won like one or two more games, he really would have been in there for that Heisman conversation because he was just that good. Like it's tough. He had to deal with fucking Michael Penix, Bo Nix and Jaden Daniels like, but he was probably the fourth best quarterback in the country last year. Like he was amazing. He was he was so good. They did tr- they did turn it over twenty times, which is not great. Um, defensively though, I was I thought they'd be better defensively. You know, Brent Venables he, that's what he's known for. Year two, they did break that twenty five takeaway mark. Like that, you know, so that's that puts them in that top top tier in terms of takeaways, and it's the most important stat for a defense. Um, top fifty in rushing yards allowed. Top fifty in points per game. So they weren't awful. Passing yards allowed, they pretty much were awful. They didn't get much pressure, which, you know, I guess you could say ties into passing yards allowed. So, I, yeah, I expect them to be better defensively, and you could argue that's what lost them, you know, the two games they lost in the regular season. So let's get into their roster, though, because it is a pretty new team. Obviously, I already pointed out Dylan Gabriel, any quarterback in the country, damn near, would have been a downgrade from him. Jackson Arnold was no exception. He's going to have to learn fast. He really only got one game, I think, in the uh, bowl game against Arizona. He looked fine. I didn't think, you know, I didn't take too much away from it, but I feel like he's ready to start this season. Um, They need to lean into their run game more to take pressure off of Jackson Arnold. I think they can. They were a pretty good running football team last season. Um, Gavin Sawchuk, Javante Barnes. I think they're both solid, you know, so I would not mind seeing both of them get an increased workload. Um, what else? They did replace Drake Stoops. He was their best receiver last season. They replaced him with Deion Burks out of Purdue. Deion Burks probably going to be their new number one receiver. And overall, 
I do think that improves the wide receiving core overall. Jaleel Farouk, Andrew Anthony get another year of experience. Nick, Ander- Nick Anderson as a wide receiver four, I like that a lot. Deion Burks, like I said, should be a thousand yard guy, on, at least on paper. So, but they also did change a lot of changes, their offensive line. Um, three new starters there at least. Um, that is going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But overall, it's a good offense. Like I, I like I look at it, I don't really see any flaws or holes besides a young quarterback, but I think he should be a good quarterback. So no, nothing really negative to say about their offense defensively. They're rocking with pretty much the same unit, which I don't know if I like or not. Only brought in one new starter. So they definitely need to get more pressure. In the SEC, if you can't get after the quarterback, you're going to get picked apart. So Danny Stutzman returns, though, dominant dominant linebacker. He's their best player defensively. Let's get into their schedule. They lost. This is the thing I don't like. They lost three of their four toughest games. Okay. They took care of business. They beat pretty much everybody else. You know, beat beat SMU handedly. That was a good win. Obviously, Texas, their big win, dominated teams like West Virginia. The, how many te- did they score? They had five games where they scored 50, three games where they scored 60. Like, their offense was truly explosive. But the game against Kansas, a backup court, that was, I think that was Jason Bean that beat them in Kansas. The weather conditions were crazy, but they lost to Kansas that day. Their defense did not show up. Um, Oklahoma State, you could say it was a mix of both. Um, I think Ollie Gordon had like 200 yards that game, but this is the thing. This is the thing. Let's take a look at next season, right? They play seven of my top 30 next season. It, it might be the toughest schedule in the country. And let's just, let's just run through it. Tulane and Tennessee back to back. Texas, you get Texas at home. That's a pretty good. At Old Miss, that's a tough one. Their final three at Missouri versus Alabama at LSU. That final three might be the toughest in the country. Like, and this isn't, it's not just, isn't they play seven of my top 30. They play six of my top 16, 15. Like, oh my God, that shit just gave me chills looking at it just now. They play like six of the eight best teams in the SEC. Only thing they're missing is Georgia. So I'm going to pray for Oklahoma. This is, a, this is a sad thing. They could be a really good team. Like they could be a borderline great team, Oklahoma, and win eight games. Like their schedule is just that tough. Pencil and Temple, Pencil and Houston, Auburn probably, Maine, South Carolina. Pencil and those five, right? You probably beat Tulane. That's six. Let's say, yeah, <laughs> let's say a split with Tennessee and Texas, that's seven. But Ole Miss, Missouri, Alabama, LSU. Which of those games do you win? Three out of those four. Three out of those four are on the road against top fifteen teams, and you get Alabama at home. How many of those are you winning? I'd hope they win one. That's eight games. Like, man, how many – this is the thing. How many games are they going to be underdogs? Texas, underdog. Ole Miss, underdog. Missouri, underdog. Alabama, underdog. LSU, underdog. They'll probably be the favorites against Tennessee, but they'll be fucking small favorites. Like, man. This is the thing, though. If they beat Tennessee, right, then they're probably going to be 5-0. and And 5-0 and hosting Texas – That'll probably be a top 10 matchup, and that will definitely be the game of the week. Can they beat Texas back-to-back years? I don't know. I don't know. I think they're going to be able to score on Texas, no problem. But can they stop Texas off? It's a great question. It's going to be a great game. I hope they beat Tennessee so that that matchup right there against Texas just has that much more pressure on it. But if they beat Texas, then they're seven and oh, they'd probably be like a top four team in the country. I'm not going to get two. I'm kind of, I'm not going to do that, but yeah. Their last four games, or their last five games, I should say, are absolutely brutal. I don't expect them to win more than two of those. It, it's too difficult of a schedule, man, honestly. Like, nobody can survive this schedule and expect to win nine or ten games. So, overall, they're a young team. They have a lot of potential moving forward, but they cannot, they can't realistically compete for a playoff spot with the schedule they have. 
I would say use this year to focus on developing Jackson Arnold, um, try and make that defense better, and then target next year, 2025, as the all-in season because it's just too much. It's just too much. So we are now three or two-fifths of the way in. You now see my 30 through 20. And next video, we're going to get into my very good teams, man. I'm excited, man. This the series is going well so far. Uh, leave a like if you enjoyed. Comment if you think I was wrong on any of my rankings so far. What would you do differently? And uh, thanks for watching, man. I'll see you on the next one. And peace.